morning. Welcome to worship at Central Baptist Church. We're glad each of you has come to join us for worship. We hope that if you happen to be visiting with us this morning, you would fill out a visitor's card located in the pew rack in front of you, put it in the offering plate as it passes later in the service so that we can get to know you better as we welcome you to Central. How often do we find ourselves caught between despair and hope? Caught between those who tell us to be realistic and our vision of a better life. We are caught between those who believe the world is turning into a horrible place with no hope for improvement and those who see a different life, a better life, a life that can come to be, a life that will come to be. Today we gather here because we believe in the promises of God as we worship our God of hope this morning. I pray we will find ways to live into the promises God makes for each one of us. <coughs> now will you join me in the call to worship. We are brought here today to glimpse the vision that God has for us. Open our eyes. We are brought here today to know the, lo the love that God has for us. Open our hearts to receive that love. We are brought here today to experience the grace God has for us. Praise, Praise be to God, to God who continues to redeem us.
join me in the reading of the litany. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Praise the Lord, and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can have. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of your glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works. And I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might, so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious wonder of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures to all generations. like to invite the boys and girls to join me in the front. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Good. Are you cold? I'm cold this morning. Oh, you got a jacket on. That's real good. Yeah. Yeah, because I am um, not prepared for how cold it is today. It happened really, really fast. All right, raise your hand if you like to be happy. Yeah, everybody. There's a song about that. Oh, yeah, there is a song about that, yeah. Um, what, just real quick, think in your head, what makes you happy? Everybody have something in your head? Yeah. All right, now everybody say it at one time. What makes you happy? I'm roller coaster. Oh. <laughs> I'm not scared of the dark. Oh, you're not scared of the dark, so you're happy. All right. I, those were some really good things I heard. One person said food. <laughs> food makes me happy, too. And roller coasters. Roller coasters really make me happy. Yeah. All right, so here we go. I'm going to talk now. This, that, this is kind of a tricky question, though, because I bet there are a lot of people and a lot of things that really make you happy, right? But you know what you should do? You should concentrate on making yourself happy sometimes. And do you know that actually whether it's yourself or other people making you happy, it's really your choice on whether you're happy or not? Did you know that? You get to choose whether you're going to have a good day or a bad day, right? That's all about what is happening inside of you. You could choose to be grumpy every day, right? Do you know anybody like that? Oh, no. Aaron. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> You can choose to look on the bright side of things or on the dark or sad side of things. Do you guys know this person right here? Or he's not a person. Eeyore. Eeyore. Is, does Eeyore choose to be on the grumpy side like every day? Yeah. He's always upset. Always upset about something. The world is going to end. Everything is sad. We don't want to be like that, do we? He never has a good day. And... Each of us gets to choose whether we're going to be happy or be like Eeyore. When my mom sings to me, I feel back to happy. Oh, I love that. When your mom sings to you, you're, you're turning back to happy. That's a real easy thing to make you happy, so you must be a happy kid. So here's the really important reason why we should be happy, because when we are happy, we encourage other people to be happy. And God wants us to be happy, right? God created this world for us to live in, and we can choose to see the good things in the world, or we can choose to really concentrate on the bad things of the world. And yeah, we do get sad sometimes, and we, and we can be sad, but we can, we can recover from that, right, and choose the happy. The Bible teaches us to be glad and rejoice forever in what God has created. 
And the word rejoice means to celebrate or be happy. So we get to choose that, and that is the really good news for today. Yet be happy for what we have. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us happy spirits and hopeful hearts. Help us to spread our happiness to everyone we meet. Amen. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already. Long ago, it was here before our time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please join me now in prayer? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we live inside the cycle of your creation. A cycle that renews itself with each new season. A cycle that renews itself with each new generation. You have created us to take our place within the changing of these seasons, within the passing of these years. We carry on from the generation before us and in a blink are gone as a new generation follows. Remind us of our place in it all. Remind us even of how small our place is, how short our span of time so that we might understand that our task is not always as great as we may imagine. We leave to you the task of changing your creation. We leave to you the work of transforming your world. We leave to you the renewing of minds and the restoration of bodies and the salvation of souls. And we take for ourselves only that which has been given to us to testify to your goodness through our worship and to make known your will through our obedience to your commands. We ask these things in the name of the risen Christ and in an act of obedience, we pray the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat>
please join me in prayer. Lord, thank you for the blessings you have given us. You have said whatever we give is acceptable if we give it eagerly. You said that we should give according to what we have. Help us bring our offerings with an eager heart, not as a comparison with others, but as an act of worship. May our presence be with us every hour of the day. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Destroy. 
Claudia, thank you. Julia, thank you, choir. <laughs> How many of you knew your great grandparents? Some of you still know, I think, in this room, still know your great grandparents. Uh, as we sit here right now, how many of you could tell me the names of all of your great grandparents? A few? In a traditional family structure, you should have four sets of them. How many of you can tell me anything about their lives? Where they lived, or what they did for work, what they enjoyed doing for pleasure? Can you picture them? Do you know what they looked like? Can you remember the sound of their voice? Some of you know more and some of you less, I suspect, about your great-grandparents. At our annual staff retreat about a month ago, I asked our staff, all of us individually, to come prepared to tell the group about our great-grandparents as a way for us to get to know each other a little better. All of us had to go back and do some research in preparation for this assignment, some asking around in the family to get names and and dates to learn just a little more about our families. And we all had gaps when we got there ready to share. All of us knew more about some branches of our family tree than others. I didn't personally know any of my great grandparents. They had all passed away before I was born. And even though I just did the research about them a month ago for our staff retreat, as I stand here right now, I can only tell you for certain the full name of one of my great-grandparents, Moses Perryman Sapp, and I know his name because his initials are MPS just like mine. We, we constructed, my family constructed my initials after his. I know the family names, the Lanes and the Powers and the Lewises and the Saps, but the full names I'm not sure of. They all died, all of my great-grandparents did, in the last 70 years or so. All died within my own parents' 
lifetimes, but even within their own families, if I'm any indication of our family as a whole, even within their own families, my great-grandparents have largely already been forgotten. Their homes are gone. The houses they built and lived in their entire lives are no longer standing. You, you can't go back and, and point to a place. I've been back to where they're from. It's mostly a guessing game. We drive down dusty country roads and through long deserted coal mining villages. And we point. I think their house was there. <clears throat> The only thing left, as I told you about a year ago after having made a, a quick tour back around the old home places through Kentucky, the only things left in those communities that we can point to with any certainty that provides any level of connection between our families then and now are the churches. The churches are still there. Their whole lives, my great-grandparents, entire lives, all of their cares, all of their struggles, all of their joys, all of their moments around the dinner table together, the, the things they cared about, the things they worried about, the things and the people and the places they loved, their most cherished memories, their most important possessions, their most fervently held beliefs, the daily substance of their whole lives is now completely forgotten, or nearly so just vanished from history, not even 70 years after they have passed away. And what was true before will be true again. What was true in the past will be true in the future. What was true for them will be true for me. With any luck, my children's children will know me. They'll know something about who I am. Eventually, they'll remember something about who I was. But their children, my great-grandchildren, in less than 100 years, they'll have to ask somebody what my name was, where I lived. They may one day come searching for my grave marker like I've gone searching for my great-grandparents' grave marker. And if my, my efforts are any indication, they may find it and they may not. We'll all be lucky to remember it at all, just 70 years after we are gone. The writer of Ecclesiastes writes, Meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What do people gain from all their labor? Generations come and generations go. No one remembers the former generations, and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. That was written 3,000 years ago, and history has proved that idea right. What was true 3,000 years ago is still true today, at least it is in my family. There really is nothing new under the sun. The world and its never-ending cycle, what has always been, will always be, everything is meaningless. Utterly meaningless, the teacher in Ecclesiastes says. We've been working through a list of books and authors together at Wednesday night Bible study this fall, a, a series that's held together by the unifying, unifying idea, things that restore my soul, taking our inspiration from that phrase in Psalm 23. Uh, as we've done so, as we've worked through a list of authors and books that have been important in my life and restorative in my life, I've tried to pair people together on successive Wednesday nights, pair together authors and preachers and teachers and theologians and artists. I've tried to, to pair folks together who are connected, in my mind at least, connected somehow through 
thought or style or impact or influence. And as I've done so, as I've paired those folks together for study on Wednesday night, without really trying to, I've noticed that the pairings connect people who are roughly contemporaries. They connect people who worked and lived and breathed and died around the same times. They may have never known each other. They may have lived in different countries. Their work may deal with different themes and ideas, but their time connects them. Pastors Fred Craddock and Eugene Peterson were were roughly contemporaries. Born within just a few years of each other, something about their styles and their natures and their approaches to their work connects them. You can see it. They're products of their time. We talked about Wendell Berry and Frederick Beekner together one Wednesday night. Very different men, but something about their place and time seems to connect them. Same, same idea. Last week, we told stories from three remarkable women, Anne Lamott and Barbara Brown Taylor and Annie Dillard. One is from Georgia, one is from California, one grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Very different women, approaching the faith from very different backgrounds, with very different particular interests, but something about the way they think and write and communicate connects them in my mind. And they were all born within a decade of one another. Their three births separated by less than nine years. The older I get, the more I realize how important the world we live in is in shaping us. We think we have a chance to mold the world around us, but it's the world that's shaping us. People born within two or three years of you, either way, older, younger, they grew up watching the same things on TV that you did. They grew up hearing the same music on the radio. They grew up wearing the same clothes, the same brands, and the same styles, and the same trends. They grew up remembering the same pop culture fads and celebrities. They were shaped by the same world events. It doesn't matter whether you grew up in Richmond, Virginia, like I did, or Waynesboro, Georgia, like Julie did, or or Texas, or California, or New York City, or a cornfield in Kansas, or right here in Noonan. People who are the same age maintain an enduring connection throughout life. You can recognize it in just a few minutes of talking to someone. This person grew up about the same time I did. I bet we're really close in age. An enduring connection because we grew up in the same world. Even if we didn't share the same space, we grew up in the same time. We all like to think we're independent. (laughs) That we've freely arrived at our own choices to become who we are, but the world you grow up in shapes you. It's much more likely to leave its mark on you than you are to put some kind of new stamp on it. We're somehow all the same, products of our time, and we always have been. Our our rivers flow into the same oceans and return to the same sources, so to speak. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. The writer of Ecclesiastes notices these very same things, too, and says, really, what's the point? Nothing ever changes. There's nothing new under the sun. With that in mind, listen to these words from Isaiah 65. See, I will create a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. They'll be gone. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. Now that's something different, right? That's something new. Instead of nothing ever changes, Isaiah writes everything will change. 
In Ecclesiastes, the teacher says, all of our labor is in vain. Isaiah says, and I quote, my people will not labor in vain. Ecclesiastes says, we spend our whole lives working only so that the ones who come after us can enjoy the fruits of our labor. Isaiah says, a day is coming when the people will long be able to enjoy the works of their own hands. Ecclesiastes points us to the way things are. Describes the world as we experience it. Isaiah points us to the way that things will be. And we stand in the middle, between the times, as it were, as Christians, trying to hold the two together. How do we live faithfully in the world of Ecclesiastes? While pointing faithfully to the world of Isaiah. Well, instead of feeling as though we're being stretched between two opposing ideas, I want to suggest something different. Taken together, the ideas of Ecclesiastes and the words of Isaiah, I want to suggest a new way of being and one that we can each choose to embrace for ourselves before we walk out the door today. Just like Katie told our kids, we have a choice about our mindset. If Ecclesiastes is true, and our impact on the world is much smaller than we often think it is, if we are less important than we often think we are, if all of who we are and all of what we worry about will be forgotten before this century is out, if those things are true, then you, all of you, should be a lot less anxious than you are right now. <laughs> you should dial the anxiety way, way down. <laughs> What's here today is gone tomorrow. Stop chasing after vapor and eat, drink, and be merry instead. <laughs> We read the first verses of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, together in worship. Eat, drink, and be merry is what follows, Ecclesiastes chapter 8. <laughs> and in chapter 11, verse 10, So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body. If Ecclesiastes is true, you should walk out of this room ten pounds lighter and lighter in heart than when you walked in. And if Isaiah is true, you should dial up the courage. Knowing what the future will look like and knowing that the future will be good for us should make us unapologetically brave. The world is heading in our direction and we can all choose to live as if that promised future is already true right now. So Isaiah says, here, reorient your thinking around time. A day is coming when it won't be as scarce as it is right now. Everyone will live to a ripe old age. A hundred years will seem like only a start. So have some courage and live as if that reality about time is true today. Reorient your thinking around possessions. A day is coming when there will be plenty for everyone, when all will get to enjoy the fruits of their labor, so be brave. And live as if that day is here right now. Reorient your thinking around relationships. A day is coming, Isaiah says, when enemies will become friends. When the wolf will eat with the lamb and the ox and lion will share from the same straw. Knowing that those things will be true. Have the courage to live as if they are true now. 
be half as anxious and twice as brave. When you walk out of here this morning, you can choose to be half as anxious and twice as brave as you were when you walked in. Live with the courage that the good work God has begun in you will one day be brought to completion in all of creation. Be half as anxious and twice as brave. Create for yourself a new way of being. When we choose to live by the revealed wisdom of God, In this book, in passages just like these, and in faithful relationship with Jesus Christ, we both point the way to the coming kingdom, and we draw others into a new way of being, too. Until the world as it is in Ecclesiastes becomes the world as it should be in Isaiah. May it be so in us today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're less important than we think we are. Our influence is less substantial than we believe it is. So make us half as anxious. And we know the future you have planned for us. And we can begin to live as if that future is true in us today. So make us twice as brave. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll find the words to our hymn of response printed in your worship guide. We never end a service at Central without giving you a chance to respond. If there's a way that you would respond publicly this morning, I would invite you to make that public decision known by meeting me at the front of our sanctuary as we sing that departing hymn together. things quickly before we go this morning. Uh, Number one, this Wednesday evening is our annual Thanksgiving feast night. It's the last Wednesday night before Thanksgiving when we all get together to celebrate our church family together. Even if Wednesday night isn't normally a part of what you do during the week, I'd encourage you to come this Wednesday night and just have dinner with us in the fellowship hall at 5 p.m. It's always a fun, fun night at Central In addition to what we normally do on our Thanksgiving feast nights, that also means that today is your last opportunity to vote for who you think will win our first annual Donut Hole Challenge. Uh, You'll you'll see the jars spread around the church today in the office hallway here and over by the fellowship hall as you leave uh, church this morning. Uh, I am competing against Mason's right there. I think Baron's back here somewhere. He's downstairs. to raise money for our global missions offering and mostly to raise awareness for the global missions offering that we'll collect together in December. A a silly way to support a good cause. Come and be with us on Wednesday night, this Wednesday night at 5 p.m. Also, our teenagers, some of our youth are on their fall retreat right now with Steve Cothran and several chaperones. They're on their way home right now, having spent the weekend 
at Camp Glisten outside of Dahlonega, Georgia. They should be home anytime. We remember them as we worship today and know that they've had a great time away from us this weekend. And today we celebrate Veterans Day. It is Veterans Day weekend. To every veteran in this room, to all of the veterans in our families, to every veteran in our congregation, we say thank you. We are very grateful for your service to our country and all the sacrifices that you and your families have made on our behalf. Thank you all for being present in worship this morning. Uh, I'm grateful for your presence here. And as always, I hope every last one of us leaves this hour of worship encouraged and emboldened to be faithful representatives, both of our church and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bow with me now for our benediction. Depart now in peace and as you go, may the God who makes all things holy and whole make you holy and whole, put you together spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our Master, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.